So it really is indeed a pleasure to be here. Um, I was here, I think, five years ago last time, and uh, my message has stayed hopefully, well, maybe not hopefully, but it stayed very, very much consistent. Um, as Jim alluded to, well, our lab has been focused on what some people have called the darkest matter of the human genome. We're specifically interested in regions that change very, very rapidly, specifically within the human species, areas of the genome that have been proven to be dynamic both in terms of structure, their organization, and in terms of their evolution. Um, as he mentioned, uh, specifically we're focused as one aspect of that study on regions of the genome that are highly duplicated. And so these come in, in two different flavors. Um, these are duplicated sequences that are either duplicated within a chromosome, known as intra-chromosomal duplications, or duplicated between non-homologous chromosomes, known as inter-chromosomal duplications. The reasons we're interested in this are really twofold. One, these are dynamic by dint of the fact that they have sequence identity at, at very high levels to non-allelic homologous recombination, promoting additional rearrangement events at these specific sites. The second reason is that if you believe the work of Susumu Ono and others, duplication is the primary force by which new genes and gene families evolve. So we're interested in these regions really from the perspective of dynamic mutation, de novo mutation associated with disease, and second, from the perspective of the evolution, potentially, of new genes and gene families within human. And both of those topics I want to discuss today. So I just summarize uh, the work that came from really uh, analyzing the whole genome, really the finished human genome. Uh, this is the pattern of the largest and most identical duplications within our genome. The blue lines representing these large blocks, greater than 95 percent, greater than 20 kb in size, of intra-chromosomal duplications. And you'll notice from this that a lot of our duplications are essentially interspersed. So if you look at chromosome 7, you find a lot of the pairwise, the large ones, are se separated by megabases of sequence. If you add the interchromosomal pattern, you get something like this. So this is the pattern of the human genome. It's been relatively constant through the new assemblies. And most of this data, I should point out, came from back-based sequencing. This is the sequencing of large insert clones. If you go back and look at some of the first published whole genome shotgun assembly uh, versions of the human genome, these genomes, these areas of the genome are completely missing. The important point is about 60 percent of the large duplications within our genome are interspersed. So as I say, they're separated by at least a megabase from their nearest neighbor, or they map to another uh, chromosome. If you contrast this with some recent data that we've done with Deanna Church, and looking at the kind of the comparable finished version of the mouse genome, this is the, the pattern that you see for the most identical and the largest duplications within mouse. So in this, the total amount of duplicated sequence in the mouse genome now turns out to be very similar to what we saw initially with human, roughly 5 percent of the genome. But you'll notice two things. The actual locations of these are fewer in number. So there are about half the number of sites in the mouse genome that are highly duplicated. And the second thing you'll notice is that essentially most of the lines, the blue lines here, which indicate intrachromosomal duplications, are right on top of one, and each, one, and one another, suggesting that most of the duplications in mouse, about 82 percent of them, are tandem, that is to say clustered in orientation. So this difference between man and mouse in terms of finished back-based sequence assembly has important ramifications both in terms of evolution, the fact that you can juxtapose different pieces of DNA creating complex configurations that you don't see in closely related species, and also in terms of disease. So its importance in terms of disease comes from really this, uh, some of the seminal work from Jim Lupsky and others in the early 1990s. And the idea is very straightforward. If you have duplicated sequences within a genome, you can trick the recombination machinery during meiosis to recombine where it shouldn't. So here's showing two of the four chromosomes aligning during meiosis, the duplicated sequence shown in green, and a non-allelic homologous recombination, also known as an, an equal crossing over event occurring, leading to gametes that have accumulated an additional copy of that duplicated sequence or have lost a copy of that duplicated sequence. So the really important part is that is if these are essentially interspersed, imagine intra-chromosomal duplications now with unique sequences encoding genes A, B, and C, genes A, B, and C get taken along for the ride. So in addition to producing gametes that have additional copies of that duplicated sequence, we now have cam gametes that have additional copies of genes A, B, and C, and we have gametes that have lost copies of A, B, and C. If those genes are triplosensitive, haploinsufficient, sufficient, or imprinted, the result is disease. And so there are, at this point, about 30 different syndromes in the human population that are caused precisely by this mechanism. It is not really a genetic disease because it doesn't have to be transmitted. There's something that goes on in all of us as we sit in this room 
and we produce gametes, either egg or sperm. And an architecture that has a lot of these interspersed configurations is obviously going to be proposed, uh, be pr uh, predisposed to these types of events at a much higher frequency. So these are some of the diseases. I'm sure many of you have heard of some of them. Uh, Vital cardiofacial de George, Williams syndrome, prader willi and so on. There are two interesting aspects about uh, these diseases, if you look at them. So shown here is the actual size of the duplication, which is mediating the rearrangement. And the important point here is that most of the events are large. The duplicated sequences have to be greater than 10 kb, often greater than 100 kb in size, to mediate a high frequency of de novo event. The second point is that the degree of sequence identity is also very high. So typically, most of the diseases are caused by duplications that are greater than 95%, and the vast majority are greater than 98%. And the third component of these diseases, which you can kind of see here, is that the vast majority of diseases that have been described thus far involve some type of neurologic component, either peripheral nervous system or central nervous system co cognitive deficit with these uh, kids. So the hypothesis was very straightforward. If we had a beautiful duplication map of the genome, which was born on the sweat of a lot of wonderful people working on this project over the last 10 years, could we use that as essentially a morbidity map to predict the sites of disease associated with these specific regions? And specifically, could we focus on children with mental retardation to find new diseases previously unknown? So this is this duplication map I showed you again. So it was not just a quality control exercise for the Human Genome Project, but we actually viewed it as a disease map. And so here's our road map. All the gold bars represent blocks of sequence where the architecture is such that you would believe to be a high frequency of de novo mutation based on very large, very identical sequences at these positions. So there are roughly 130 regions at that time of the genome. Uh, 23 at that time, which are the gold bars with letters behind them, were ones already associated with disease. And we were betting that the remaining, at least some subset of those remaining regions, would be associated with de novo disease in the human population. So the way we did this, this is kind of old technology now, but we, did this, we began this work about two and a half years ago. We targeted all of our regions that had at least 50 kb of unique sequence, less than five megabases, that were flanked by duplications greater than 95% identity and greater than 10 kb in size. We took backs from these regions and we built a specialized microarray which contained about 2,000 backs from these roughly 130 regions of the human genome. We spotted them on a microarray and we simply would test a given normal DNA sample labeled with one fluorochrome against a diseased individual labeled with another fluorochrome and look for signal intensity differences based on hybridization to this chip as evidence or gain of loss of that specific region. So in terms of a study populations, we used a normal control group, which people have argued maybe isn't the best normal control group, but it was what we had available at that time, which included all the HapMap samples, as well as a, an additional diversity panel of roughly 45 individuals. So we used these normal individuals to establish the normal pattern of variation within individuals without disease, or at least with the, without disease uh, associated with mental retardation. So I'm not going to go over those details other than to say that we found a lots of copy number variation. So hearkening back to something that Claire mentioned, the human genome has riddled with copy number differences and gains and losses of sequences in different individuals. We then focused on a collection of kids that essentially the clinical community, or at least diagnostic community, had given up on. There's roughly 500 children, uh, children which have been tested for Fragile X, have been come back negative, children tested for um, uh, uh, subtelomeric rearrangements and children whose karyotype was normal for testing using this platform. So some of the results. So after screening the normal collection, then following up with studies of these three, roughly initially the first 291 children from Oxford, we found regions of the genome that look like this. So what you're looking at here is a log two relative hybridization intensity plot for four different individuals. These are all children with mental retardation. And we're looking for things that deviate from the log two ratio of zero, which would be no difference. And you'll probably notice that there's a lot of noise over these regions, but this is because about a third of our probes were actually selected right from the duplicated regions. So the denominator really isn't 2n, but it's actually more than that. So this actually creates some background. But clearly, there's something different about these four kids. They have essentially about five backs that are apparently showing evidence of microdeletion in a region that we never saw once in a normal control group of study. These are validated by fish. I think the most uh, probably interesting aspect is that we could actually go back now and do a more high density oligonucleotide customized microarray. So instead of using five backs in a region, we designed now 11,000 oligos 
over that specific region and really confirm to see whether the breakpoints were identical. So shown here are those four children once again. This is the log two relative hybridization intensity. Depression shown here in terms of log two indicated by significance in terms of when you see the red signal. And what you can see here is a couple of things. First off, if we compare the affected child with that of the parents, so this is one of the ch children compared to mom and dad, you see mom and dad are normal over that area, but they essentially have a delete, the child has a deletion of roughly 450 kb precisely at that site. You also notice here, this is the segmental duplications. These are very large, highly identical duplications which share about 199% uh, identity over 100 kb in size. So the duplications are demarcating the boundaries or the breakpoints roughly but you'll also notice when you look at the regions contained underneath this, du these duplications, you see a lot of variation in the normal population as well. The important point here was that we had essentially a, an identical critical region in four children identified from this study of mental retardation. All of them had haploinsufficiency, at least as that's our model. Um, and in fact, all of them that we've been able to test so far were de novo events. In other words, parents did not have this lesion. This was seen specifically in the kids. On top here are some of the genes, and there's five genes mapped into that region. We don't know which causes the disease, but obviously there's some great candidates. One of the most interesting is MAPT, also known as TAU. It's a gene in which point mutations have been associated with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and frontal temporal dementia. So we're screening now uh, patients which have essentially phenocopy in terms of disease and looking for point mutations. I'd like to just emphasize or make this note that even though we screened only 300 kids, this was roughly of the idiopathic collection that we looked at, it was roughly one and a half percent of the total in terms of disease. These are what the kids look like. So we now, in, in collaboration with our former competitors, uh, uh, Bert de Vries in Holland, have had the opportunity to look at roughly now 21 children, all of them which have the microdeletion. 19 of them we've been able to look at parentals and show that they're de novo events. And if you look at these kids, you can see there's some similarities in phenotype. Um, one of the most pronounced, believe it or not, is this very bulbous nose that you see in almost all the kids. You see a pronounced philtrum, sometimes protruding tongue, as well as a fairly happy disposition, which has actually been noted in many of the clinical records. So the children have a better outlook than most of us in terms of life. Um, and in fact, we've now been able to go back and identify from, from de novo collections, being able to show clinicians the data, being able to identify additional kids using this approach. So one of the interesting parts of this particular, what we think is a new deletion syndrome, is that the exact same region that we identified as being deleted in the human population was a region that was described a year and a half earlier by Kari Stephenson from DECODE as being the site of a common inversion polymorphism in humans. And shown here is the region once again. Now I'm blowing up. This is actually looking at the Ceph diversity panel and the black indicating the frequency of that inversion. So that inversion is essentially restricted largely to Caucasian populations. Both European and Mediterranean populations have this inversion most common. You'll see once you get into Africa and Asia and Amerindia, you see very low frequencies of this inversion. Their data suggested this inversion, for completely different reasons, was associated with increased fecundity and associated with increased combination in, their, in these populations. And that was based on genealogical data from the, the, really the, the Icelandic population. So we went back and we looked at our kids to see if they came from haplotypes that essentially carried the inversion. And to date, 19 out of 19 cases all come from this inversion haplotype. So I want to make it clear that we don't know necessarily whether it's the inversion that's predisposing to this microdeletion event or it's something else on that haplotypic background which may be predisposing. But the data are overwhelming that this inversion polymorphism, which is ethnically stratified, is essentially predisposing or the inversion haplotype is predisposing to disease. So this obviously has some ramifications. One of the ramifications would be that this is largely a Caucasian-specific uh, idiopathic mental retardation syndrome. And our screening so far of African Americans has shown no cases of screening of 500 kids of this particular deletion. That wasn't the only one we found. So here's another region on 15Q24.1, 24.2, four megabases in size. These are the children. These are their actual their genotypes based on array CGH over oligos. Breakpoints in three of the four cases occur precisely at regions of high sequence identity. In three of these three cases, we know that each of these events is de novo. Um, these kids are fairly high functioning. They have uh, IQs of around 65 to 70. 
Um, they have been described as autistic spectrum disorder, but they have ex extra features such as uh, growth deficiency. Here's yet a third example. This is distal to the Prader Woolley region on 15Q13.3. Our initial screening, we skipped over this region, and that was because of our criteria. This index uh, patient here had a breakpoint between breakpoint 3 and breakpoint 5 actually was not a de novo event. So when we looked at the parents, the parents, one of the, the mother actually had this very large deletion over this region. However, it turned out that the mother also had mild mental, mental retardation as well as epilepsy. So we screened this one, we got two additional cases that came in. Both of these cases were smaller, they were between breakpoint 4 and breakpoint 5. These particular cases were both de novo, and in both of these cases there's also mild mental retardation or developmental delay and epilepsy. We don't know for sure if this is a genomic disorder, but or betting it is. What's particularly interesting is that there is one gene located here, Cherna 7, which is a gated ion channel gene, which has been associated, or at least has been implicated, I don't think ever proven, to be associated with myoclonic epilepsy. So we believe that haploid sufficiency of this region also causes disease, and once again, the breakpoints are mapping to these very large, highly identical duplications. And the last example that I'll show you is an example of recurrent deletion not associated with mental retardation. So we've now moved outside of kids with mental retardation and started screening kids with other types of, of pediatric disease. And so this is analysis of uh, some of those children. This is a collection of roughly 80 pediatric patients with renal disease that have been screened. What we found in this particular case was, once again, a de novo deletion. I should point out that all of these cases are de novo. Um, with respect to breakpoints embedded right within the segmental duplications. What's particularly remarkable about this disease is that, at least in terms of the studies that we looked at or the samples that we looked at, and this is largely with Christine Belen Chantelot at Paris, it accounts for about 20% of pediatric patients with renal disease that they have in their collection. So it's a very common, um, what we think is a common microdeletion. Interestingly enough, it's never been observed once in a control group of 927 individuals. And interestingly, on top of that, is essentially that about 36% of children with maturity onset diabetes of the young type 5 also have the same microdeletion. There is a gene in this region, TCF2, a transcription factor, in which point mutations have been shown to be associated with both renal disease and uh, MODY5 diabetes. So, in summary, we've actually looked at now uh, a, a large number of kids, particularly from the, uh, the IMR study, these numbers are based largely on the initial uh, 300 set from Oxford. And in these patients, we identified what we think are roughly 16 sites of novel structural variation. I wouldn't claim that the majority of those are causative, but I do feel comfortable saying that we do have at least three novel genomic disorders in which we have de novo events, recurrence, and we have phenotypic similarities that actually allow us to assign this as a new dis disorder. We have one example of a microdeletion event associated with diabetes and renal disease, and I'd be willing to hazard a bet that if we screen more children with more forms of pediatric disease, we'll actually find additional genomic disorders associated with a wide range of phenotypes. I'll just leave this one slide here as an example of, of, of why I think this is so important. We just finished screening uh, using the Illumina platform uh, with Debbie Nickerson and Greg Cooper in my group a large number of normal individuals, these are individuals that came in for uh, essentially for lipid testing as part of a study known as the PARC study. And shown here uh, is essentially hotspot regions that we find, find deleted or duplicated within this normal control group. So shown here are the duplications in, uh, in, in pink and the deletions uh, shown here in blue. These are the number of chromosomes from this collection of roughly 1920 chromosomes that were shown at various frequencies. So here is the absolute number, here's the 1% frequency cutoff, and here are a bunch of events that are roughly 0.1 and 0.2% frequency. So coming back to a point that Richard made, um, two issues that I want you, want you to think about. Not roughly in this group, we have 6 to 12% of normal individuals having big deletions precisely over regions that are non-allelic, homologous, recombination, predisposed. We have an excess, which we don't understand why, in terms of deletions versus duplications, but we have an absence of things that are around the 1 to 2 to 3 percent frequency. I would bet that these are being fed by de novo mutations at a high frequency in the normal, more normal pool, and the question remains open, what is the impact of these in terms of disease or susceptibility? 
So one of the things you might ask yourself is why? If you think about the mouse genome architecture and human, why do we have all these large blocks of interchromosomal and intrachromosomal duplications if they predispose 10% of our genome to microdelete and microduplicate at a high frequency? Well, so we've tried to address this question over the years. Maybe I'll, 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 give you, I'll kind of go over these fairly quickly. But the idea, uh, one of the important things to realize about the duplication architecture in these regions is it's not just one piece of sequence. It's essentially heterogeneous, made up of many different parts that have had different evolutionary histories and trajectories. So this is one of roughly the 400 uh, regions in our human genome. And each of the colored in gray represent regions that are duplicated. So basically this full 790 KB stretch of DNA is entirely duplicated. When you actually reconstruct the, the evolutionary history of this region, what you find is that everything in color we've been able to show comes from a different area of the genome. So we have essentially this hodgepodge mosaic over these specific regions made up of all of these pairwise alignments from all over the genome. To complicate matters, these regions then duplicate between these large duplication blocks and can share large blocks of homology in common with another. And these are the types of events, the secondary events, that actually predispose to microdeletions and microduplications associated with disease. So we have this architecture. Can we systematically reconstruct the evolutionary history of these regions? And so working with Pavel Pevsner, we came up with an approach to look at all the individual pairwise alignments within the human genome that make up these duplication blocks, decompose them into minimal evolutionary shared segments. We could break all of these pairwise alignments into individual subunits or duplication subunits. And then using data, largely from a, a work from uh, UCSC, uh, basically compare these regions of the human genome, all the duplicated positions, to see if we can identify the ancestral segment from where the duplication began, therefore provide directionality in terms of the duplications. And here the logic is pretty straightforward. Most of the duplications that we're studying are primate specific. So if we look at outgroup species such as rat, dog, and mouse, that, uh, that should not have these regions duplicated. We should see a single hit. Moreover, because the, the human copy that's ancestral moves by this multiple step procedure in terms of duplication, we should see more orthologous anchors between the human and mammalian outgroup sequence. So using this approach, we define the ancestral origin for 67% of the duplications within the human genome. We confirmed or validated by fish to see if we really could identify these ancestral origins. So we take an elk group species, we take a probe that comes from the derivative locus and we hybridize to see if it goes back to the right spot that we predicted. That confirmed, in this case, a relatively small number of experiments, 9 out of 12 times. We then also compared our experimental maps, which we had generated over the years before, with our in silico prediction with Pavel. And you can see that there's pretty good correspondence um, between the duplicons that we identified. So what do we learn from this analysis? So here's the part that we learned. If we start looking at these intrachromosomal duplication blocks that cause disease, what we find in almost all cases, particularly with, what, with one or two exceptions, is that shown here is a map of the duplication blocks. So these are all the duplication blocks that have emerged in the last 25 million years on chromosome 15. About a third of these cause disease. But one of the things that we find is that located almost precisely in the center of these blocks is a common sequence in about, in, in about 90 percent of the cases, at least for this specific chromosome. This is uh, what we call a core duplicon. It has a number of interesting properties. It's the most abundant and most ancient, as you might expect, in terms of duplications. Even though these have all heterogeneous histories, it is common to the vast majority. It seems to be the focal point for interchromosomal duplication formation. Cores are frequently duplicated as solo elements in the genome but rarely are the flanking duplicons. So the flanking duplicons are almost always exist in association with a core. And when you look at the cores, they are enriched four to five fold for both genes, at least annotated genes, per base pair, as well as ESTs. So these seem to be the most transcriptionally active, most dynamic uh, areas of the genome. When we compare those cores, and we find them on about a half a dozen human chromosomes that have experienced this burst of intrachromosomal duplication, what we find is that these cores are often associated with grade eight and human-specific gene families that have been described in the literature over the last five or six years. We described one of the first, called the nuclear pore interacting protein, which evolves about 50 times faster than most normal genes, at least based on DN-DS ratios. And there's a number of other genes that have been described. The common features of these genes is they do not have orthologs in mouse. They have multiple copies in human and chimp. 
They show dramatic expressions and changes in their expression profile when compared to at least outgroup species such as baboon or macaque. And at least three of the four examples here show signatures of, of, of positive selection, and in two cases, very dramatic examples of positive selection. So I'll just finish off by actually sharing with you some of the work we've been able to do with ERIC and NISC, particularly in this regard. Because these regions are so complicated, we really can't get a handle on their architecture from looking at whole genome shotgun sequence assemblies of chimpanzee, uh, gorilla, macaque, and so on. So working with ERIC, we've been able to actually target these regions and resequence them systematically in a number of primate species. So shown here is another core region. Just to give you an idea, these are all the locations of these cores. And this is, or I should say, these duplication blocks. So this is about 250 kb in size, and there's this core of roughly 20 kb, which is in 18 of the, or the 14 of the 16 blocks that are shown on this chromosome. This is a core which is particularly interesting as it has a very rapidly evolving gene family embedded within it. This is the nuclear pore interacting protein, such that if you look at the actual degree of sequence identity and sliding windows across this region of the genome, this is actually comparing any two of these copies, you will find troughs and peaks in terms of the sequence identity. And what's most remarkable is that these troughs correspond precisely to the position of exons. So this is this eight exon gene which, with no known function. And, and the other thing I'll just point out is that 98% of these changes are result in amino acid changes uh, in, in between the copies. So this is an extreme example of positive selection. So working with Eric, we drilled down, looked at a lot of other copies in other primates, particularly focusing on gorilla, chimpanzee, orangutan, and baboon. We sequence annotated all of the sequences that we got back, both experimentally and computationally. And then we reconstructed a phylogeny of these segments. So I hope you don't go blind. Um, but this is the actual phylogeny shown here. This is based on a neighbor joint analysis of 2KB of non-coding sequence for the core. And shown here is the structure that you see with HSA representing human, PTR representing chimp, GGO representing gorilla, and so on. So what we get from this bewildering complexity over this parts of the genome are really a couple things. Number one, all of this architecture that we now see, which we now know causes disease, is about 10 million years young. So all the events have occurred in the common ancestor of chimp, human, and gorilla, or after this, immediately after the separation of those species. The second thing, which I think is really, really interesting, is that when we look at orangutan, we find none of the core, we see the core once again present, but we see completely different flanking duplicons, which are unique in human and all the other great ape species. So orangutan has done the exact same thing that our genome did seven million years ago, using the same core, but has actually picked up completely different flanking sequences, which are unique in chimpanzee, unique in gorilla, and unique in human. So this tells us that this core is actively transducing, we think, segments of the genome around. And just to give you a perspective back now, 25 million years ago, these are all the pieces that in human look like this. Oh, sorry. So this is the architecture that we see in human. Each one of these blocks of sequence are essentially unique in baboon. They're unique in macaque. So we think these all began as unique copy sequences with the core beginning to, to jump probably about 20 million years ago, pick up flanks and continue to grow such that it now occupies LCR16A and its associated duplicons about 10% of the euchromatin of human chromosome 16, at least in this case 16P. With large insert sequences, we can also map the locations in orangutan. And so this is the orangutan picture. This is human 16, very limited activity on human 16. But here you see on chromosome 13, the core has essentially jumped, jumped to a new chromosome and begun to do its dance again on these particular chromosomes, creating a very complex architecture once again on chromosome 13, interspersed du duplications distributed across, uh, in this case, chromosome 13. So here, I think the important point is the cores are mobile. They can jump to new chromosomes, and they can actually transduce flanking sequences as part of its trajectory. I don't have time to go into all this data. Just summarize what we know about this particular core. We know that it began as a single copy sequence about 25 million years ago. And data that I don't have the time to show you it indicates that it was actually testis specific. It was expressed only in the testis, and it showed no evidence of selection by any of the, the normal tests looking at KAKS. So this is a little bit heretical, I think, because most people would teach you that ge all genes are born from other genes. Our data suggests that this thing was born from a transcript that was probably neutral in terms of evolution. 
then about 25 million years to 12 million years ago, in a common ancestor of orangutan, gorilla, and chimpanzee and human, it began to move, it began to duplicate. Some copies on this lineage duplicating specifically heavily on chromosome 16, and here duplicating on chromosome 13. At this point, when it began to duplicate, based on expression analysis in orangutan, chimpanzee, and human, we see ubiquitous pattern of expression. It's expressed in every tissue in orangutan and in human that we've ever analyzed to date. So we've looked at about a dozen in orangutan and about 32 different tissues in human. Between 7 and 12 million years ago, not on this lineage, but in the African great ape human lineage, we see extreme positive selection. KAKS value is on the order of like 10 compared to the old a world monkey sequence, suggesting that at that point some mutation must have occurred to lead to an open leading frame that was essentially selective and then became, became fixed at a very high frequency in the population. So the 98% amino acid changes that I mentioned are occurring right here at this branch. So we believe that the movement of this core led to the emergence of a novel gene family um, about 7 million years ago, probably one of the youngest and most rapidly evolving genes uh, in the human species. So in summary, I've talked about the architecture of the human genome with respect to these large blocks of duplication. I've talked about how complex they were, and specifically showed you some examples of how these, these complex, how this complex architecture can predispose to de novo, large deletions, probably of huge significant effect or selective effect within the population. Our targeted approach has uncovered four new microdeletion syndromes. We've shown that they're recurrent de novo. And I think the question remains unanswered. What is the importance of this mechanism toward complex disease? Because if you think about it, none of these events can be tagged using a tag SNP. Because they're de novo, they're occurring on different, in some cases, on different haplotypes. Then I talked about the evolutionary significance of these regions, particularly the core architecture that we think has emerged to account for the expansion of intrachromosomals within the human great ape lineage. And particularly, I'll leave you with this kind of final thought, maybe the negative selection of these microdeletion and microduplication events that exist in our species, they may be partially offset by the positive effect of having newly minted genes, many copies of them, at new locations. And if you think about it, there's a huge challenge ahead, even though they're few in number, is to work out what are the functions of these types of genes that don't exist in outgroup species and that are embedded in these very complex regions of the genome where STS and SNP mappers fear to tread. And uh, we hope to continue, hopefully, maybe I think my students say it's going to be on my epitaph that he found these genes but never actually showed the function of a single one. Uh, maybe five years from now I can come back and share with you some evidence that they're actually functional. So acknowledge these folks, Andy Sharp, Heather Mefford, they did most of the, they were postdocs that worked on the human disease angle. Matt Johnson and Zoshi Jang, they're both students who did all the work with respect to the evolution of these core regions. Good colleagues um, in sequencing centers, Baylor Washu, and specifically at NISC, who rose to the challenge of sequencing some of these very uh, uh, difficult clones. I think I have a reputation, probably rightly deserved, that these are some of the nastiest clones for sequencing centers to sequence. Thank, thank the patience of people like Bashali Mascari, uh, Bob Blakesley, um, and really Jeff Bu uh, Jerry Bouchard, who really uh, took these on and uh, took them to, to completion, at least within the primates. And a, a lot of great colleagues, um, uh, clinical colleagues, particularly overseas, that have been very uh, forthcoming in providing samples and working on collaborations. Thank you. Any questions from the floor? I'll ask Richard, one. Richard's got one. Richard, you got one? Okay. Yeah, Come you're, here. Evan, what about wild mice? Have you got any duplication data there? Are they got the same low level of these events? Nothing on, you mean wild, wild, wild outbred mice? Yeah, so no information on wild yet. We have a lot of information from the inbreds over the duplicated regions, and they show as much variation as humans do. The only difference is, is that variation is restricted to the duplications which are tandem and doesn't inf influence these unique red stretches between the interspersed duplications. So I want to ask a question. We're trying to get a PowerPoint loaded, so I'll also stall a little. Um, Evan, so the screen that you did of the pediatric patients, you made some comment that if you, you screen for more pediatric disease, you'd likely find more of these copy number changes. But there's no reason to think if you screened unusual adult onset diseases, you might find similar. Right. No, I, I, we've toyed with the idea, and we're, we're, we're thinking about doing a more adult-oriented disease, I guess, 
Um, I guess I, I kind of have this fundamental belief that if we can show it at a pediatric level, there'll be a stronger genetic component. And so I'm more interested in actually screening more kids with disease in which we don't have a good explanation than actually looking at uh, diseases where environment will play probably a bigger role and genetics might play less.